and this is cohort one of the book JavaScript for Science, and we will be covering chapter two, basic features of JavaScript. Uh, for this chapter, we will we will learn to execute some custom JavaScript program. We will also familiarize ourselves with some of the of the basic data types of JavaScript, and finally, we will create a module using the syntax uh, available for Node.js. So I hope that uh, note, the node installation works for all of you. Okay, so in this first part, uh, hello world, we'll be creating some Java, JavaScript file. We will simply will call it hello.js and inside this file, we write this command. Uh, well, console is a type of, ob of object, but this function over here, console.log, uh, it would be our equivalent to using the print method, uh, maybe for Python or for R. So once we uh, execute this function with some argument, in this case, it's simply an string, then the output, it would be the printed version of such argument. And in this case, and there is now over here, a JavaScript file called hello.js. And if, how do we execute it? Well, we can do that via the terminal. So let me open a new terminal uh, over here. And over here are the instructions. We have our file hello.js. So first, uh, where is it located? In this case, I am, this terminal is linked to this current directory. So in order to access this hello.js file, I would have to go to this uh, to this directory js files, then to the directory chapter two, and then I can access this. So we will write node space and now the path for this specific JavaScript file. As I said, in my computer would be js files chapter two, and then the name, right? Hello.js. So now, now that I press enter, then the output of this JavaScript file is shown in my terminal. Just the printed version of this string. And as we can see, well, console is an object, but it's also a built-in module that comes uh, with any browser. Well, for any modern browser, uh, this dot notation is similar to Python that we can access the part of an object, in this case, the part log, that is a function, so it is a method of the object console. And also we can define strings via this uh, single quote or, <coughs> or double quote, it, it doesn't matter. It still gets executed. Uh, uh, there will be a, a note about the use of semicolons in this extra section that I added, but for now it's not relevant really. So let's move let's move on to the next section. That is basic data types. So it turns out that JavaScript, uh, well, what I have labeled over here as JS, uh, it has no integer type. So it's only working with floating point values. And that is like the, the usual real numbers that we are accustomed to. Um we can access what type of value, sorry, what type of sorry, what is the type? of some value via this type of operator. Um, such value, sorry, such type will be returned in the form of a string. And in, in this later part, we, we will also be using this const declaration. And um, this const declaration is used when you want to define some value that cannot be reassigned. So we define some integer. The value would be 123. We find some floating point number. Well, some real number. Uh, 123.425. And then simply we define some, some string. <clears throat> and over here, uh, we will be using console log again to print uh, to print some expression, but we will be making use of this 
of, of this type of syntax, we are using this back quote a string, I think was the name. If you want the, the, specific, chat, the specific character, is this one over here, and I have shared in the chat. And um, really, it does the same as if you are familiar with Python, as it works with, as, uh, as an F string. And if you are familiar with the glue package from R, then uh, it's very similar as well. Over here, we have our string, but now that we want to concatenate the value of some variable, for example, this variable and integer, then we grab this, this value via this notation of a dollar and closing and, and opening and closing brackets, as we can see over here. Similarly for the rest, it's just a string, except for this part where we use that type of operator. So we have to leave a space. And then the type of what do, do we want? In this case, it's the type of this specific variable. And again, we want the result of this expression. So we wrap it with this syntax and, and the dollar. And we use the same thing for all of these, for this real value and for this string. And in that case, this would be the output. For the integer, as we can see, the type of 123 is number, but also the same. Also, we have the same type that is number for this real value. So again, there is no integer type for JavaScript. And in the case of this text, then the type of this text is simply a string. And just as a quick check, we can also ask what is the type of this console log function that we have been using? And um, well, the type is function. So the function is also a data type for, for JavaScript. <laughs> Also, similarly, we can use for loops in JavaScript, and the syntax is a little bit different. And in this case, we are defining some array, and it is an array because it is being enclosed with this type of brackets. And these values are specific to JavaScript. This is simply a Boolean value, true. And define and null, we, we will specify what they are a little bit later. But the main idea is that given this array of three elements, we can iterate over such array in, in this fashion. We define some local variable name value uh, that is going to represent each of the elements in this array. So in this first loop, value is a, sorry, this value variable is a true element. In the second loop, this value variable would be the second element that is undefined. And in the third and last loop, because there are only three elements to this array, this value variable would be this null type. Well, this null uh, object. I think it's a null. Yes, it's a null. So for each of these loops, we simply console log or like print what is the type of each of these. And as we can see, the type of true is Boolean. The type of undefined is undefined. And the type of null is an object. Over, uh, also, in many parts of, the, of these notes, I added links to, to, the, to the usual or, or like to the common documentation for JavaScript. And, and that is these pages uh, from developer Mozilla. Sometimes if you look for, for something about JavaScript, like you have some doubt or some question about it, uh, Google at least will link you to this page. I think it's called We Three Schools. Uh, but really it's not recommended to, to use it because sometimes it's really just a, a, a subset. So it contains information that you would have, heard, that you would have also received in, de in developer Mozilla. Um, at least from what, I have, well, from what I have read, sometimes this website uh, has uh, incorrect information about JavaScript. So maybe let's uh, mainly work, sorry, mainly search documentation for JavaScript or really any front-end technology, well, any basic front-end technology in this site, developer machine. 
So as I was saying, uh, this let uh, expression that we use here, uh, we use it to define some local variable that we can reassign its value. So we can change the value of such variable. Again, this Boolean type that we just encountered, it can either be true or false. Uh, and define simply means that uh, there, is, there hasn't been, a, a value hasn't been given. And in the case of null, means that it has a value, but uh, that value is nothing. So before continuing on, are there any questions or comments? Okay, no, no comments. So in this part, a uh, control flow, uh, we will work with uh, a little more features of JavaScript. In this first case, we will work with nested loops. So again, we define an array, but now this array, uh, its elements are also arrays. The first element is this array that contains two strings and its second element, well, because it's separated via this comma, it contains uh, other strings. So a similar syntax to the previous one, we define a for loop. In this case, we're actually accessing these elements of the nested array, that is first this one, and then we will access this one. But then in the second, in the second loop, in the nested one, we're going to access the inner element of the outer one. That is, in the first loop, we access this element. So now over here, we will, we will be accessing this element and then this one. Now, in the second loop for this one, we would be accessing the second element, sorry, the elements of this array. So first this one and last this one. So we, we will simply print uh, such elements and, and the output is what we would expect. Northwest, Northeast, and then Southwest, Southeast. Uh, well, similar to really any programming language, we can use if, well, probably any programming language, we can use these, these conditionals, if and else. So in this case, uh, we're going to, to witness uh, something that is quite bizarre about JavaScript, and that is what does it consider to be true? For example, we will be evaluating these values, that is the element zero, one, an empty string, a non-empty string. Uh, well, this type of uh, variables that we have been working with and define a null, and then an empty array and a non-empty array. And uh, we simply want to know if these elements, well, first, what is its type, and then if we get a true value when evaluating this element in an if conditional. If the conditional happens to be false when evaluated, so we would get that the printed value is that this element has a falsy uh, value. That is not false, but when evaluated in an a, in a if conditional, then it is being understood as false. So we check, right, for every of these. Zero of type number turns out to be false because if you evaluate it over here, if zero, then uh, you get a, a false expression. So the else part of the code gets executed. Now for one, the, that is a number, but the, the result of the conditional is now true. So it, this type, this number, sorry, this element, with number type is truthy. And really that happens to be the case for any number that is positive. And now for these empty strings, we get a false result, but for non-empty strings, we get a truthy result. So again, the conditional is being evaluated as true. And defined is considered as falsy, null as falsy, 
Now, this empty array that we had over here is being considered as truty. Um, note that that is, that, that is different to the empty string. The empty string was falsy, but the empty array is truty. And now, of course, this non-empty array is truty as well. Uh, and really, as, well, as we have just seen, the type of elements that you can define for a JavaScript array, really, they can be anything you want. They can be numbers, strings, and the other, other arrays and such. So we say that the JavaScript arrays are heterogeneous. And over here, I wanted to share, well, it's not really, I mean, just a, a weird fact about JavaScript about why using the, uh, the equality comparison that it's really probably the same syntax for most programming language. Uh, why, if we would try to use that in JavaScript, we get some pretty weird results. And um, as a consequence of that, it is recommended that if you want to, to com sorry, to, to compare an inequality between two parameters, two values, then this triple, triple equality is recommended. And this operand is called the, for this operator is called the strict equality. And this is why, for example, let me zoom in, zoom out a little bit. Okay. So you can read this. I will give you, I know, 10 seconds. Okay, so I hope that was enough, in, in, enough to convince you why use a strict equality instead of the usual one that we are accustomed to. So let's go to the next part. Are there any questions? Uh, do you want me to slow down the pace or uh, how do you feel? Hmm. Okay, the pace is too fast. I don't know why I'm going really slow, but I will try to be even slower. Uh, maybe this wasn't understood, so I will just explain it. Although it's pretty weird to explain a joke because it gets lost. Okay. So for this part, uh, well, they are performing this comparison in JavaScript. So if the number zero equals the string that only contains a zero character, and JavaScript recognizes such a comparison as true. Now, they ask JavaScript if zero equals the, the empty array, and again, JavaScript recognizes as true. So of course, if zero equals the this string and zero equals this empty array, uh, well, by the usual, by the usual properties of, of really of the equal, of the mathematical equal operator, we would expect this string to be equal to this array. So they are asking now this. And um, what does JavaScript say? False. So I don't know it's pretty weird. Uh, if you want explanation for that, uh, they do include it over here in the in the book. I think it's section. And we let me check it again. Sorry, here. Or here, section 23.1. So after reading the, after reading this part, then it, it does make a little bit of sense uh, why this happens. Okay, now we will be working with formatting strings. And really this concept uh, we have already covered. It. Uh, I just introduced it earlier, earlier on, 
and because the the syntax that they use in this part, I mean, it could be simpler. Instead of giving a bunch of parameters for the console log function, you could you could use the formatting spring syntax from the beginning. Um, it's a little bit easier to write. Uh, it's what, it's really what we have just seen. So in this case, you get a string, but if you want to include or sorry, to interpolate the value, sorry, some value into your string. So in this case, we want to interpolate the value of this color variable, okay, where this color variable is simply an element of this array. So something like red, green, or blue. Then we use this backticks and this syntax uh, to grab the variable that we want to evaluate and interpolate it into our string. So message would be color is red. In the next loop, color would be green. So message would be color is green and such and such. And, and so <clears throat> now that we have this message uh, variable, now we can simply print this result. We show what is a message. So something like color is red. And again, we simply con sorry, interpolate it with this string again, and then we interpolate the value of this okay, in a string form. So to uppercase, that is this method. Uh, well, as it says, it's going to transform to uppercase uh, some string. So now that we execute this loop, we get color is red, that is this message over here, and then the text and capitalized is, and now as we can see over here, this color that is each of these elements, it's getting converted to uppercase. As you can see, red, green, and blue uppercase. Okay. Now moving on, moving on to objects. Uh, really, these objects uh, for JavaScript, they're equivalent to Python dictionaries in the sense that both of them are a collection of key value pairs. Uh, I think they even have the same syntax to define one, that is this type of brackets. Wait, I, I know if these are called brackets. Let me look here. Uh, I think it's called curly braces. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, so we use these curly braces in order to define an object. Um, well, the keys must be must be strings, but really the values can be anything. So I will I change a little bit the example from the book. Now, and there is quite an ironic part because in the book they mention that you can visualize an object in, the, in this tabular form. However, they completely ignore the fact that the console object also has a table method. So we can represent this object over here. Also in, in tabular, sorry, we can print it also in tabular form instead of just using the usual log. So that's why I changed the example and really, it's also pretty simple. So I defined an object named person, it would be, this would be the key, so it is a string. This would be the value of such key. In this case, it's my name. Uh, another key, uh, remember you could use single quote or double quote. And um, now the values are numbered. So of course, these values can be of different type. It doesn't matter. And in this part, you can also avoid using <clears throat> quotes for the definition of the keys. But that is only the case if the is a type of key. Uh, it's pretty simple as a string. That is, it's not something like, uh, let's say, if this were to be a, uh, a key, because there will be some confusion with this character. It could be uh, interpreted as a type of subtraction. So it did, in that case, then you would need to wrap it with quotes. But this one over here, it's pretty simple. So really it doesn't matter, it's a okay. country without quotes. And now we have defined this object, 
you can use the table method that is it is a property of the console object but such property it's also a function so we call it a method so now we use a table method of the console sorry of the console object uh, and the parameter would be this object over here that we have to find and the output is really this tabular well table representation of the object we have over here which are the keys the keys were name age country and um, where which were the values associated with those keys uh, really what i have already defined right name lucio my age and um, the country where i live now objects have an object type um in order to access the value of some object well there are two basic syntax one is this syntax via the brackets so over here key name would be a string that represents the key but again coming back to this example if the key is a simple string something like country and not the other example that i showed that had a minus character in it then you can also use this syntax then again it's it's the same as in python Um, and another thing about objects in JavaScript is that you can, if you want to access all of the information that they contain, and you want to access such information, like read it, uh, sorry, being able to read it uh, in a simple fashion, then you can convert, like convert to a string, or perhaps it's better to say, representing a string form, this object. And to, to perform such representation, we use the stringify function from the JSON object. And now that we perform this function to the person object that we have defined over here, now let's simply print the output of such expression and we will get this object, but now in a string fashion, as you can see over here. And, and, that, and that happens to be really, really useful. Uh, if you, for example, uh, in more complex projects, if you want to pass maybe some data frame that is being represented as a string, uh, sometimes it's, if, uh, it's difficult to pass around data frame, something like in a CSV file or something like that. So you can do something like stringify it. So now you only are passing a string. And then you can use another function from this JSON object that is called parse. So it would be console log JSON parse. And over here we would be, sorry, the input would be the, the string representation of your object or something like this. Uh, and now, the evaluation of this sorry, uh, really, uh, no, no, really, only this of this would be that now you are recovering the object for JavaScript and that is this object over here. So that happens to be quite useful in, in many cases. When you want to pass around uh, uh, a JSON file or a data frame, sometimes it's convenient to stringify, stringify it and then simply parse the string. A nice example of that can be found in when you are using parameters or part. Um, there was an interesting, I think it was this. No, I don't, I don't remember now, but there, were, there was an interesting application of what I just mentioned. Of passing a data frame via a string form instead of the usual CSV file or JSON file. And now we're covering the almost last part of this chapter, and that is functions. Uh, well, I do digress uh, with uh, with some of the comments that the authors mentioned in this chapter, but I will explain later on why why do I have that opinion. 
So let's simply begin by how do we define the function? Because, I mean, we already know what the function is. So let's simply see a syntax for it. So we define function. Then over here to the right side, we can put the name that we want for that, for that function once that we want to evoke it. So like use it to, so sorry, to, to use it at, in, in the code. But it's not necessary. You can you can do something like this. Uh, you, you, will, you will be defining some anonymous function. But in this case, it's not anonymous because you're giving, you're giving it a name. Or here there is a list of parameters. It can also be empty. And also you can uh, set a default value for these parameters. If there were if if there was more than one, then you could do something like ABC. And maybe you want C to be initialized as zero if there was no argument for it given once that this function is being applied. And now for the content of the function that is the instruction, sorry, the instructions that it is going to perform, uh, it's really the same as how you grab it with these uh, curly braces. So in this case, um, the author defines some function that you input an array and the output of this function is going to be the lowest and the highest values in such, a, in such array. So remember, how can we check if an array is empty? Well, every array has this length property. Um, if, remember, remember, if the length is zero, then this expression would be zero. And zero is considered falsy for JavaScript. So what they are doing over here is they are checking. If this is, if this is true, that is, if the length is zero, because once negated, it would be false. Uh, and let me show you that. You can use this negation operator, not only for true, and not only, uh, let me zoom. You can use this negation operator not only for true or false, that is the, the Boolean value, but you can also use it for numbers. Negating one is false. Why? Because one is true. However, zero is false. So once you negate it, you get true. And you can negate it again and, and get false. And you may think, uh, this is quite hacking. Uh, so it, it, it would seem irrelevant, but it's really not. I mean, at least in, from what I have encountered by just reading source code of different projects, many times if, if the, the author wants to use it through or false values, instead of writing this, I, I think it's more, more common to, to do this. Well, in this case for false or this for true. I am not sure why uh, some JavaScript developers do that, but this type of syntax, uh, it, it is quite common, I'd say. So as I, say, as I was saying over here, if, I, if value of length is zero, that is if there is no element for the array, uh, after negating, well, zero is false, so after negating it, you would obtain true. So in this case, this would be evaluated and the function would return this uh, uh, array with undefined values. However, uh, because we are actually, we have, we are not in this case, we can, we know for certain that uh, the array is not empty. So use this notation to access the elements. Let, let me also uh, execute it over here. So let's say we find an array, one, two, three. And now the arrays are zero indexed instead of one x indexed, like R does. So if you want to access the first element, that is the number one, you have to use zero. So again, same as Python. So they are simply doing that. They set an initial value for low. That would be the first element in the array. An initial value for high. Again, the first element in the array. And they are simply going to iterate for all the values in the array and compare, and compare, right? If this value is smaller than what initially was low, 
then redefine low as the smaller one. And if this current value is higher than what we thought that was the highest, then redefine high to be the to, to be the to, the, to be the greater one. So after this iteration, you simply get the lowest value and the highest value, and you use return to specify the output of this function. If you do not use return in your function, then by default, uh, the output would be undefined. So really we can execute this. Uh, so you think the console again. So I simply copy paste the code. It's a limits function. Maybe let's use it for this array. For this empty array, the output is undefined as defined, as we said. But now maybe for this other array, does it find the lowest and highest values? And yes, yes, it does. So now let's do the same thing, um, but again to, to realize some weird properties of JavaScript. And in this case is that it will try to compare anything that you give it to compare. So in, in this first case, we will try to use limits with this empty array. We already know the output. Then for this unitary array or other array, but now we will be comparing strings. It is still the same syntax. We saw they were numbers, but really we never specified that. So now JavaScript is going to try to compare the strings. And this part, it's going to try to compare a number between a string, a number between an array, and a string. It's going to compare to if it is lower or greater than some array. So we do. We apply the limits function for, for all of this. It's just a loop. And the output. Okay, and the output is this. For the empty array, uh, there are no limits given because the output was a array with undefined values. For this unitary array, where lowest and highest are nine, the only element. In this case, it works. It does work for three, 30, and 300. Lowest three, highest 300. But now that we compare strings, uh, what does it say that it is the lowest one, grapefruit? And what is the highest one, uh, banana? I, I am not sure how is it comparing them. Something, perhaps something like alphabetical order and giving and considering higher uh, those words that start with the lowercase letter. But I am not sure. Uh, that's my best guess. And now that we put this, that we perform this comparison, uh, what is the what is the output? Three and three. So for, for some reason, three is lower than apple, but three is also higher than apple. So again, JavaScript uh, will see this. Uh, well, and you also may be tempted to think, okay, so. Yes, I believe you, JavaScript is pretty weird, but why haven't these issues been fixed? Um, and the fact is that when JavaScript, um, a lot of pages, not really only the modern ones, but also some really, really old ones, uh, a lot of pages depend on JavaScript. So if you change this type of behavior, probably some old pages will break because they will be longer they will be no longer be compatible uh, with this sort of uh, weird properties of the JavaScript programming language. Uh, and then uh, the author says that there is also another way to define functions, perhaps not using the familiar way of function, some possible name, and then the list of parameters. But um, a more modern approach is to use what it is called the fat arrow syntax. That is, you first define, well, as a constant, the name <clears throat> the name of your function, and then you put your your list of parameters. Then this fat arrow 
and over here, you put the scope that is this curly brace that defines what are the instructions for your function. So really this part highlighted is the same as we had over here. Really the only change from this to the, to the other one is that you remove this function part and then you change this way. List. So what are these values mapped to? Map to this. So that's really the, the difference in the syntax. And of course, we can, now that we have predefined this function, we can execute it again. Does it work the same? And it seems to work the same. However, well, and the authors, I think they do not mention it, but this type of different syntax, they do produce different uh, behavior in our functions. For, for this simple case, really the, the output was the same. But so over here, I put an example of where do, do the functions define with this common syntax or the more modern one using this path arrow. Uh, where do they differ? Um, well, in, in this link, they explain a special case where they do have different behavior. And that is related to this object. It's called this. And I wanted to show you an example over here. So let's go to the book so that you can witness what I am saying. I think there is time to, to finish. So if we go to the book, uh, let me reopen it over here. <clears throat> so of course we can inspect the HTML elements of the page. Uh, that is the, the code that was uh, created to, sorry, that was written to create this content that we are seeing. So we press Control Shift C. Um, let me move. Of this to right, and now as I highlight over some specific items in the page. Anyway, they are not being highlighted. Uh, okay, now yes. We are getting uh, what element is that? I'm getting I highlight this, and it says it's a p tag that is it's a paragraph over or in the right, right? It says class author and then the content. But I wanted to focus on this one this H1 title. That is simply the main header for this page. And it's this one over here, H1 class title, JavaScript for data science. This thing over here. Uh, I am going to show you an example, but first I want you to understand what this means. Document for, for this document that is in this page. Okay, let's select a specific HTML element. And as we saw when I highlighted this, it said H1 in purple, that is the name of the tag. And to the right, it says dot title, and there is a CSS class. But really the only thing that matters is that I have to copy paste this part, H1 dot title, in order to access such elements. So in this function, the input would be what we just saw highlighted, H1 dot title. And now I have accessed this part of the page. So if I do something like for this element, what remove it, then as we can see it was removing, sorry, it was removed from the page. But I don't want to remove it. I just want to, to say it that when I click on such header, like on this thing over here, uh, that some specific output is going to be shown in, into the page. We're going to define that in two ways. So first we access such header, such header, this part over here. And now we are going to say to JavaScript that when I click on such element on this, uh, what is going to do? Well, it's going to console, it's going to console log. No, wait, I changed the page. Okay. It's going to console log the value of this this object. And then we are going to set another instruction so that for this header. When I click in such header, then we are going to do the same console log this, but now 
we are defining this function exactly the same, but via the far arrow syntax. So that syntax is the only thing that supposedly is changing. So now let's perform that. Let me move this a little bit. Okay. Ah, uh, uh, by the way, this is the subject that we can see over here. Now let's copy paste the code that I was mentioning. So this is it. this is direction. Uh, okay. Once I click on this, this will be printed, the value of this object. So I will print, I will click. And what are we seeing? Well, the element that we had access to before. However, now I will perform the same, but this function, I will go to write it in, okay, there is a comment. Okay, share has to Okay, so I will be doing this, but I simply change function to this fat arrow syntax. And now I press enter. And now when I click this header, we are getting a different value. For this, no. Okay. For this, for this first value, well, what says H1 class title? Well, that, that was the output when we didn't use the fat arrow syntax. But now for the second one that says window, 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 that is the output generated via the fat. Well, we are, we are the function defined with the fat arrow syntax. So the instructions, it's really the same. It's just console log this, this part over here. However, the output is, is different. In one case, I get this specific element that I have clicked. And for the fat arrow function, I get this global object uh, for, the, for the browser. So, it's not like I uh, always use modern uh, syntax that is always used for tarot syntax. But sometimes it's more convenient to just use uh, the, the usual syntax function, possible name, and, and this. Okay. Um, for this last part, it's simply uh, about models. Well, models are useful if you want to organize your code into multiple files, instead of having one big JavaScript file. And JavaScript has several model systems. And Node.js Node uses one called CommonJS. Um, at least nowadays, all modern browsers support the current standard that, that is called ESX. Now, ES6. And this ES is because really JavaScript official name is ECMAScript. There are also another type of model systems. I think it Webpack and Bower, but uh, I think they are not covered in the book. And, and an important factor of, mod of module is that the variables that you define in the module, they are scoped to the module. Uh, that is, you will know you will not be able to access, to access those values outside the module unless uh, they have been attached to the global object. That is to the window that we just saw. This thing over here. On the other hand, globally defined variables, uh, you can use them. They are available within the module. So really just to finish up because we don't have much time left. Uh, let's define a model, a model using Node.js. And we'll they provide an example. So maybe just, let's just take a look at it. Uh, over here, let me close this, okay. So we, we have this folder, chapter two. And over here, there are three JavaScript files. We are going to define our model as this one called utilities.js. So uh, what do we do? Well, we set some variable as a, as a initial value for this parameter that we are defining for this function using the fat arrow syntax. Uh, and, and what this will do is that for clip, that is for this function, 
we are going to pass an, an array. And the output would be an array, sorry, an array of the elements of the initial array that we have passed, but only those elements that are smaller or equal to this bound that we have specified. Uh, and then to, in order to use this clip function that is defined in this model utilities of the yes, in order to use it outside of this module, then we use the syntax. So we write module that exports and in, in this object, we define the key that we want for, for, the, for a specific value. And in this case, uh, this will be the value is simply the function that we're passing. So if you if we want to use this clip function outside of outside of this module, then it will also be called via the clip name. If we want to call this clip function via another name, then we can change change it over here and like clip. So now this would be the name that we would use outside of this module in order to execute this clip function. And but but let's not do it. Now, we're going to use this model utility JS in this file called application JS. And now to access these exported values, we use this syntax. At least for not the JS, they use the require uh, function. So from which file is it going to look? In this case, it is it's looking in the same path. As we can see over here, no, over here. And then it's looking for the utilities file. And there is a one over here. So we have utilities. That's going to be this object over here. Utilities now equals this one, this variable, I mean. So we define some array, and we're going to execute this clip function from the model that now has been exported into this object. And we are going to call it uh, via this name that we have set, this name clip that we set over here. We're going to call it and evaluate it for this specific array. So let's simply just run such file. So uh, where is this application.da file located within? This specific path, so node, and then JS files, then chapter 02. And what is the name for this file? Application.js. Okay, I press enter, and we get the, the, the output, right? If you use a clip function for this array, then you should only, you should only get the values that are smaller or equal to three because there, there was no second argument over here. So we are using the default value for such argument. And in this second part, we're using the clip function again, but now this default, sorry, this bound, that is the second argument, it is being specified. It is five, so only the elements over here that are smaller or equal to five should be returned. And, and that is exactly what we got. Yes, uh, Final comment about what I, what I mentioned about the name is that let's change the name that we set for this function once it is exported. So let's put it clip, not clip with three eyes. I save it. And now that we're going to call this, uh, where is it? It's being called into this object, utilities, but now the key. It's different. It's no longer clip, but clip with three eyes. So let's change that as well. Clip and over here. So I save it. I know that I execute this application.js file again. Then it still works. So it's really just this name that we were changing over here. Uh, While well, there were exercises, I completed a couple of those. Yeah, but um, well, for anyone watching this video or 
for the one person still in the meeting, remember that you do have to do the exercises because there are beautiful things that we learn in, in those that we will need them for later sections of the book. So that's really it. And that's all. Are there any questions, comments and before wrapping up? Yeah, there is no comments for my side. Thank you very much uh, for taking us through the this chapter. I think I really learned a lot. So for my own part, I would like to outside uh, the JavaScript for data science book. Is there any other book in which you can recommend? And for your script? Um, outside this book, is there any other good book in which you can recommend for learning JavaScript? And yes, I like this one over here. Uh, let me remember the name. I don't think it's called Master in JavaScript. Ah, no, Eloquent. This one over here. Eloquent JavaScript. It goes quite in depth. So let me link it over here. Uh, and of course, it's quite interactive. So it works great. And when you are reading it and trying to run the examples. And just yes, uh, as a last comment, uh, I provided these links so that you can see when is it useful or not to use semicolons. Sometimes you do have to use them. And those cases are explained in the links. So I hope that you also find the time to read them. Uh, and with that said, this is the end of the meeting. So thanks all of you and uh, see you next week. Yeah, I think uh, next week uh, we are having daylight saving time. Am I correct? Or uh, next week, Shell is going to be presenting. Okay, no problem. No problem. See you next week. See you, bye.